Hi, Al Williams here. I recently did a presentation for an IEEE student group called Be a 1% Engineer, and I thought I'd share it with you. you know, my definition of 1% engineer are the engineers that really excel in some of the non-technical areas. So there's lots of folks that can design stuff and do the math and modeling, and but the people who can really go out, define problems, understand the business case, you know, negotiate, sell, uh, those kind of things, that's really an important skill for an engineer to advance, but a lot of times we don't pay a lot of attention to that, and that was kind of the point I was trying to make. Eh, 1%, you know, keep in mind, as I always like to say, 89.7% of all statistics are made up on the spot. So who am I and why am I having this conversation? I did a Bachelor of Computer Science with about 60% of my coursework in EE from Mississippi State University and uh, Thomas Edison State University as well. And then I, if there had been a computer engineering degree when I was in school, I would have had that probably, but that didn't exist when I started school way back when. And I finally wound up uh, going ahead and getting an MSEE from Columbia. So I've been working in the business for a long, long time. I've been through a bunch of these things, and I've seen, you know, the the classic engineer with the white socks sitting in the back room doing stuff nobody can understand, all the way up to, you know, people who are, are very high-powered business people and maybe don't have the technical knowledge that you wish they had, and everything in between. Uh, I've authored a lot of books, lots of magazine articles and blog posts. I currently blog for Hackaday.com. I wrote for Dr. Dobbs Journal for a long time. I've got two U.S. patents. I was a Boeing Technical Fellow for 11 years. I've led projects ranging from space station related projects to Army projects, uh, many things. My specialties are kind of FPGA CPU design, microcontrollers. I'm currently the director of IT for a gas pipeline company, and I particularly focus on cybersecurity. So, Keep in mind, this was a presentation to students. I always ask, what do you think an engineer is? And I get a lot of answers to that. And depending on who I'm asking, I, I sometimes get pretty close, but the answer I'm always looking for, and I don't ever think I quite get it, is it's somebody who applies math and science to solving real-world problems. And, you know, sometimes that's a little fuzzy with science. So is somebody studying the reproduction cycle of bow weevils, is that a scientist? Probably but what if they're trying to use that reproduction cycle to disrupt it so they can control crop loss? Well, that's practical, so maybe that guy's an engineer, actually. And there's lots of different kinds of engineers. You know, like I mentioned, I'm kind of a computer engineer slash electrical engineer, but there's lots of other kinds of engineers, and I think what's in this presentation really applies to all kinds of engineers, and maybe even all kinds of people that aren't engineers, too, a lot of it. So. Today, if you're an engineer, you might think, well, I don't care about all these soft skills because I'm going to work by myself. And that's really tempting. And there's certainly lots of TV and movies that show, you know, the genius guy sitting around doing everything by himself. I don't know that that's ever really been true. Uh, if it has been true, it's been true a long time ago and hasn't been true lately. So, you know, it's I always say it's the professor on Gilligan's Island where he just kind of knows everything about everything. And that, that guy doesn't exist. Things are way too complicated. Uh, even if he ever did exist, you couldn't do it today. So I'm pretty broad background in, in the computer stuff. I mean, I worked for Motorola taking apart microprocessor chips, so I know how microprocessors are fabricated down at the silicon layer. But I can't build my own microprocessor chips, you know? Even if I actually kind of know how, I don't have all the equipment. I don't have the resources to do that. I don't really have the time to do it. So even if I think I'm going to work all by myself, well, I've probably still got to go buy microprocessor chips, and I'm probably going to buy resistors, and I'm going to buy, you know, all manner of things that other people have designed and built. So you, you really have to be able to figure out how do I work effectively with other people, and there's a lot of answers to that. And so I think the 1% engineer, and I kind of talked about this a little bit, I mean, I think you've got to be technically strong. There's no doubt about that. You can't be a great engineer and not be technically strong, but you also need to be able to understand business problems. You need to be able to develop viable solutions. I was telling the class the other day, 
no one ever comes up to you in your job and says, oh, you know algebra, what's 4x plus 10 equals 7? What's x? You know, that never comes up in the common workday. They come up and say, how do I, you know, make cookies and quit wasting so much dough by having a different die shape or something? You know, those are the kind of things you get asked. When you do have a solution, you've got to be able to convince others to either accept that solution, participate in developing that solution, fund it, any number of things like that. That 1% engineer can do that. They can sell their ideas. They can negotiate with people that have different ideas and arrive at some mutually beneficial solution and make that happen. So I don't want to say that tech is not important. That's not at all what I'm saying. I mean, certainly you've got to have the technical acumen to make these solutions and make them work but a lot of people have technical skills and it's not enough if you really want to stand out into that one percent to just say well i'm the smartest guy in the room all the time you probably aren't anyway i'm not but uh, even if you are that's not sufficient you you've got to be able to work with other people that you're going to depend on so how do you stand out how do you make that happen and so the question I had for the students was, what's the most important thing you need to have for a successful fishing trip? And I rarely get the right answer to this. Once in a while, somebody will finally get it. But I'll hear people say, well, you need good bait. Uh, you need, you know, the, the line. You need a, you know, I've had people tell me beer is the most important thing. That may be, you may be able to make an argument for that. But the answer I'm looking for is fish. Think about that. It doesn't matter what kind of gear you have, what kind of boat, what kind of bait. It doesn't matter. If there's no fish, you're not going to catch fish. So then turning that around, my question to the students is, what do employers want from new hires or, or even from old hands? Or really, you could distill this to, what does anybody want from anything? And I think the answer to that is results. So one of the things that that 1% engineer is going to do is, is we're going to demonstrate our, the value of our projects because... That's the result people care about. No one wants to say, oh, um, I built a new amplifier. That doesn't mean anything to a lot of people. But saying, I built a new amplifier that lets me crank my music up while not using as much power, or it costs less than an amplifier I'd buy at the store, well, that's a value. And, you know, the other thing that I see about that is if you want to show results, you need to find problems, but you also need to offer solutions. It's very common to just say, oh, that's not going to work, or we can't do that because, okay, but then how do you do it? What do you do? What's the alternatives that are going to try to meet the most needs at the least problems? So, you know, I, I do this in another class that I do, talking about design trades, where you'll say, okay, what do we want in a car? Do we want a car to be safe? And the class will all say, oh, of course we want a car to be safe. And you go, okay, well, let's make it out of a solid block of titanium and, you know, it'll cost $500,000. So do we want a $500,000 car? Well, no, because we can't sell $500,000 cars. Okay, so what's the solution? And the solution might be, well, let's not make it quite that safe, but let's make it really safe while maintaining affordability. Now, here's another tricky question. This is a Black & Decker drill. And, you know, Black & Decker makes a lot of things now. I think they make toaster ovens and, you know, who knows what. But this is really what they were famous for was making drills. So I always ask the students, and it seems like a trick question, what does Black & Decker actually sell? And people will say, well, they sell drills. Well, yeah, okay, but what are they really selling? And I'll sometimes get some soft answers like, you know, well, they're selling quality. They're selling their brand name. They're selling their, you know, and, and, and I guess that's true, too, to some extent. But the real answer I'm looking for is Black & Decker sells you something that you want. Do you want a drill? No. You want holes. You're not buying a drill. You're buying holes. And if somebody came up with some other way to give you holes that was better than the drill, then you'd want to buy that, not the drill. That's really an important point. You know, my dad was a salesman, and in the sales game, they always say, don't sell steak, sell sizzle. People don't want steak. They want the sizzle that comes from a hot steak on the plate. And it's the same thing here. You've got to be able to get into the mindset of that customer. So I don't know anybody that works for Black & Decker, so I apologize in advance if this isn't true, but 
You can imagine at a company like Black & Decker, there might be all these people sitting around and all they think about all day is drills. And they go, wow, drills are great. And look at this drill. It's got this balanced handle and it's, it's just awesome and it's great. But in reality, no one really cares. They just want the holes. So you've got to put all those arguments into why does this make better holes or, you know, however you define better. So this drill lasts longer so you can make more holes before you have to charge it up. Or, you know, this drill can has more torque so it can make drill, you know, drill holes in different material than the, the other drills or whatever. But you've got to remember that the customer doesn't want the drill, they want the holes. That's really a key point, I think, especially for a young engineer to get out of your mindset and get into that customer's mindset. And you say, well, I'm not working in a retail business. I don't really have a customer. That's not true. You always have a customer, unless you're just doing stuff for your own enjoyment, at which point I guess you're your customer. But there's somebody that wants whatever it is you're doing or solving or studying, and they're your customer, even if it's an internal customer. So speaking of sales, what's the easiest thing to sell? And I get a lot of answers to this one, too. People will say, well, yourself. And I'm like, no, I think that's maybe one of the hardest things to sell. Um, I've gotten a variety of other answers to this question. You know, people say, well, people want to buy cars. People want to buy, you know, vacations, whatever, clothes, food. But I don't think any of those are the easiest thing to sell. I think the easiest thing to sell in the world is money. Now, what do I mean by sell money? Well, I'll give you a story. One time, a guy came to my house, and he said, I've looked in your attic. I measured your house. You've got this kind of insulation. Here's a chart from the U.S. government that says, on average, a house like yours is going to cost X number of dollars to heat and cool per year. Now, if I go in and put radiant barrier in and increase your insulation to this level, that same chart says it's going to cost this much money to heat and cool your house every year. And that's about, you know, I don't know, let's just say $2,000 less. And I'm going to charge you $1,500 for doing all this work. So at the end of, you know, however many months that works out to, eight or nine months, you're now paying money not to do this. Well, gee, guess what? I got radiant barrier and increased insulation because why wouldn't I? You know, in a couple of months, it was paying for itself anyway. That's how you sell money. And in particular... You know, if you're going in for this, these students were real interested in job interviews and internship interviews. And I was telling them, you know, you've got to make that employer realize, well, it's costing me money not to hire this guy. Why wouldn't I hire somebody like that? So you've got to show that value. And that's the thing, and I'll come back to this later, but that's one thing I see so many times on resumes is where people say, well, I did this and I did that and I did this and and if you're technical, you probably understand the value to that, right? I, uh, I don't know. Let's take a computer thing. I re-indexed an Oracle database. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Well, I re-indexed an Oracle database to improve query speed. Okay, that's a little better because maybe I understand that's a good thing. But what if I say I made improvements to an Oracle database that allowed our database server to handle 40% more queries in the same period of time as before, which forestalled us having to increase our server farm by that amount. Okay, so therefore I saved so much money. And if I could tell that dollar figure, if I could say and I saved $50,000 in our data center, well, that's even better. I saved $50,000. Everybody understands that. It doesn't matter if you know what a database is or an index. Everybody knows that saving $50,000 is a good thing. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can show that you've earned money. You know, I got, I got more sales. I got more customers. I got a contract from the government worth X. Uh, you can save money, like the example I just said, where you say, well, okay, I was going to have to go spend money on these extra servers, but I figured out a better way to do it. We didn't have to buy the servers. Therefore, I'm selling you money again. Or I can reduce or eliminate expense or loss. That's one that's hard to see sometimes is you could say, well, okay, you know, somebody messed up and this project's going to be in the hole half a million dollars. Oh, wait, I figured out something and now we're only going to be in the hole for you know, $200,000. Well, okay, you just made money and that's a, another way to sell money is that negative offset of a loss. So practical knowledge is really important and especially if you're fresh out like these guys were, it's easier than ever 
to get that kind of experience. I mean, we're living in an internet world where you can go look on websites like hackaday.com, and yes, that's a shameless plug, uh, Instructables. You know, there's a million places where you can go find things to do and actually do those things. Uh, build a robot, build a IoT device, build a clock, build, you know, I'm, I'm picking on the electrical things, but there's all sorts of other stuff, right? If you want to be a mechanical engineer, there's all sorts of machining projects, and there's really cheap and easy access to components and tools that would have been unthinkable when I was, you know, in my teens and 20s. So if you really want to get experience, it's pretty easy these days. And I don't know how this will work, uh, being on a video, so I'm just going to describe this with to you. But this was a BBC video. You can find it on YouTube if you go look it up. And it's a, basically a researcher or journalist, I'm not sure which, and they, they go to MIT's campus. And I know this says Harvard, but that's because this was a Harvard study. But they went to the MIT campus, and they show all these graduates, and they're saying, you know, oh, we, we're the best engineering school in the year uh, in the world. And as they come along, the camera crew calls, you know, the reporter calls them over and says, excuse me, so do you think you could light up a bulb with a flash, a flashlight bulb with a battery and a wire? And, you know, you don't know how much of this was edited. So some of them might have said no, they didn't show those guys. Some of them might have said yes and just done it in two seconds. They didn't show those guys. But what they did show was a fair number that went, uh, yeah, I think I can do that, or, or said, yeah, I can definitely do that. And, of course, what did they do? They hand them a battery, a wire, and a light bulb, and they said, go ahead. And it was surprising how many of them couldn't do that. Uh, now, I would think, this is a few years old, I would hope because of all the proliferation of, you know, Arduinos and people building, you know, the maker movement, if you will, or the hacker movement, that I would think a lot of those students might have done better today. But my point is, is as far as all the soft stuff, you still got to have practical knowledge I guarantee you, especially if you're an electrical engineer and you go to a job interview and they say, here's a battery, a piece of wire, and a light bulb, make it light up, and you can't do it, you probably aren't going to get that job. So look that video up if you get a chance. It's pretty interesting. Uh, again, it's a little older, and I'd hope they would do better today, but I wouldn't want to bet my last dollar on it either. So back to the less technical stuff. Think about the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. To me, that's a lot of customer service wrapped into one place. And if you think about it, you know, if you go, if you go to the store and say, oh, I got the wrong thing in the mail and it was broken and it didn't work, whatever, do you want that guy to go, eh, whatever, you know, what do you care? It only costs 10 bucks. No, you don't. You want them to go, oh, I'm sorry, let me figure out how we can fix that for you, help you, give you a refund, give you a coupon for your trouble, things like that. So it always amazes me when I see people who can't figure that out because we're all customers and we all want people to service us and it's really easy to just think, what would I do? And that kind of comes back to what I think is a central theme to all of this is you could really distill a lot of this advice down to empathy, right? I mean, I mentioned before, you got to understand that people don't want drills, they want holes. Well, if you empathized with them, you'd know that. You'd know that... When you walk into Home Depot, you're not thinking, i got to have a drill. I'm going to put it on my desk and look at it, and it's going to be the best drill in the neighborhood. You're just thinking, I need to put some holes in some wood, and I don't have a drill, so i got to go get one. You don't care about the drill. You care about the holes. Same thing here. I don't care about your quota for closing help desk tickets or your quota for uh, you know resolving stuff. I want my problem fixed, just like I would if I went and had a problem with somebody else so that empathy is a really powerful tool and it applies to so much of this even like the selling money you know okay well, what would I want I want to save do I want to save money on things yeah nobody has ever said you know what I could save a lot of money on this but I don't like doing that I think I want to spend more of my money I've, I've got too much money I've never heard anybody say that interesting psychological study I think it was on brain games that I originally saw this and it was a little bit different uh, this particular study I found on the internet, and they were talking about, they, they showed kids a candy box. But I'm going to, I'll let you read that if you want, but I'm going to tell you a different story. It's the one that I saw, and I, I, like I said, it might have been on Brain Games. I wouldn't swear to it. It's a good show if you don't watch it, by the way, is Brain Games. It, they showed the kids a doll, 
or actually two dolls, and they'd say, okay, this is Timmy. Timmy's mom gives him a dollar, and he puts the dollar under his bed. Now, he goes out to play, and while he's out there, mean Bobby sees the dollar, and he takes it, and he puts it in his closet. Now, when Timmy comes back from playing, where's he going to look for his dollar? And apparently, if you're about three years old, you go, oh, well, he's going to go in the closet because that's where it is. And I know that, and I don't have any understanding that not everybody knows what I know, so Timmy's going to go to the closet. And when you get to be about four or maybe a little, you know, I don't know exactly what the age is, and I'm sure it's not just a, a switch flip, but around four to five, the kids will go, oh, yeah, he's going to go look under the bed, and he's going to say it's not there, and he's going to be mad. So, again, that goes back to empathy, being able to get yourself in that other person's head. Now, for us, that all sounds stupid, right? You say, well, of course, you know, the kid's going to go look under his bed. He doesn't know. But I'm always shocked how many times in the course of a work day I don't see people doing that. They don't get into that other person's head. Um, I knew someone once who wanted to get a scholarship. And they said, oh, yeah, I want to go. I want to get the scholarship because I want to go to uh, I want to go to Paris. And, and it would be great to go travel around Europe. And I thought, well, you're not going to get that scholarship because the guy's handing it out. That's not what they're interested in. Now, if you said, I need to go to Paris with a scholarship because I'm going to work overseas when I get done, and that will help me get a head up on, on that, or, or I want to be able to do import-export business, international business, and I, that's the kind of thing those guys wanted to hear. Now, maybe you really do just want to go to Europe and party. And that's, don't blame you. That's a lot of fun. But you didn't get into their head. Why did they want that? Why did they want that drill? Why did they want that hole? And what's it look like from in their head? And that's kind of what I think the, the story about the kids kind of illustrates. So that means we've got to communicate with these other people. And again, empathy is a big, big part of that. I've got that third on this list, but really it probably should have been first. The you know, tech history is full of people who had great ideas and just didn't communicate them well. And it's also full of some pretty famous people that didn't have great ideas, but either took them from people that didn't know how to make the most of them or took credit for them uh, or just beat them out of the market with, with an inferior product. So I'm always telling students, you know, learn to write. I didn't like that for a long, long time. I had a very good writing mentor later in life that, that taught me the value of it. Speaking in public, that's a great skill to have. They tell me that most people are more afraid of speaking in public than they are of death. That's unbelievable. Um, you know, it really shouldn't be that painful to go out and speak to people about something you care about. Now, granted, I know if you got to get up and just talk about something you don't care about, that's probably not any fun. But, you know, go up and have a good time. I always tell people, if you aren't having a good time when you're making a presentation, why would you expect anybody else would? And so go out and have fun with it. Uh, entertain people and get your message across in that kind of way, and you'll find it, it just gets easier and easier. You know, we've already talked about empathy quite a bit. Negotiation, I mean, that's something else. Not just saying, well, this is my way or the highway. Most of us can't get away with that. So we really have to learn how to say, okay, you know, what are the things that are going to bring you to the table? And I'll give you some of the things you want, but you have to give me some of the things I want. Uh, if you're familiar with EDUX, the website with the free courses, and they, they charge you sometimes if you want like a certificate or something, they have some classes on negotiation on there that are actually pretty useful. The power of asking. This is one thing I've always found really interesting, is that a lot of times we don't get what we want because we just don't remember to ask for it or we're too afraid to ask for it. And there's a real powerful thing that happens when you actually just start asking people you know, can I have a discount on that? Can I, can you waive that fee for me? Uh, just ask. And certainly that's one thing I always do in a job interview is I will always say, you know, my dad was a salesman. He always taught me to ask for the sale. So in that spirit, I'd like to tell you, I want to, I would love for you to consider me for this job. I think it'd be a great fit. And, uh, you know, I think I would bring a lot to the table and I think I would get a lot out of it myself. So please consider me for this job. Ask for it. Ask for the sale. If you ever took CPR training, it's kind of interesting. There's a uh, pr thing they teach you there that if you're ever having a heart attack, that what you shouldn't do is just say, help, help, I'm having a heart attack. Because 
it's not that people don't want to help you. And, you know, you've heard that before, right? Somebody's calling help, help the police, and no one calls the police. It's not so much that people are just like, eh, I don't care. What if, what if that guy's having a heart attack? What if he's getting robbed? You know, I don't care. What it is is that you think, well, I'm probably not the right guy to help, so somebody else will help. And, and then it turns out everybody thinks that, so nobody helps. The right thing to do, according to CPR class, is to be very specific and say, you, in the red shirt, call 911, I'm having a heart attack. And almost invariably, that guy's going to go, oh, okay, and he'll do it. It's not that people don't want to do it. They just aren't going to take that initiative on their own, and you have to do it for them. And I think that's part of that power of asking. I think sometimes people would do something for you. They're just not going to take it upon themselves. Another interesting part about asking, and this was from some study that was done a long time ago, they took a bunch of students and they said, oh, you know, you want to earn some extra money uh, here, we got copies to make, we'll pay you, you know, I don't know, whatever the going wage was for people making copies. And the truth of it is they were actually doing a psychological experiment. And they, while these people were lined up waiting to make copies, and I'm sure they all had lots of pages to copy, they had a woman come up and she'd go to the front of the line, she'd say, excuse me, I have five pages can I use the Xerox machine? And they found that 60% of the time people would go, yeah, sure, you know, and 40% of the time they'd go, look, there's a line here, go get in the back of the line like everybody else. But if that same woman would go up to, you know, obviously a different group of people and say, excuse me, I have five pages, can I use the Xerox machine because I'm in a rush? Then 94% of the people would go, okay, sure. And think about that for a minute, because I'm in a rush? Well, yeah. Is that really that big of was that that big of a stretch of deductive reasoning to say, well, this woman doesn't want to wait in line? I guess it's because her hair's on fire. You know, no, she's in a rush, and so that really didn't add a lot of new information. It's not like saying because there's a meeting at three o'clock and it's two fifty-five. You know, that would actually been a, even better, and I'll bet that would have brought it up even higher than ninety-four percent. But here's what's interesting. If you add absolutely no information, look at that last one. Excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I have to make copies? Well, of course. What else would you want to use the Xerox machine for? Uh, you know, there's absolutely no information in that sentence that you didn't already have. 93% would let her up in the front of the line. 93%. 93 and 94% over 60 just because you said because. And it almost didn't matter why the because was in there. You know, I need to make, you know, can I use the Xerox machine because I'm eating lemon meringue pie? Probably would have got 90% to 95%. So that's a really powerful thing when you ask. And always remember to do that is give them a reason why you're asking that. And it doesn't even have to be a particularly good reason. Now, if it is a good reason, I think that's even better. Like I said, I, I imagine if you said, can I skip the line because I've got a meeting in three minutes, that would have probably even brought that up higher. So a lot of this turns into know who you're talking to, know what's important to them, know what you want from them. That's really important. I'm going to talk about that again in a minute. And make sure they know what you want from them in terms of what's important to them. And that's really empathy if you think about it. It's saying, okay, why is this guy, you know, who, who is this guy? Who is this woman? What is it they want? And how am I going to put what I want in terms of what they want? Now, know what you want from them. I cannot tell you the number of times I have had people call a meeting with me or come to a standing meeting, present me a bunch of charts, and at the end of it I go, okay, what do you want me to do? You know, do you want me to agree with you? That's a really easy one, but sometimes that's not really what they want. Or do you want me to buy something? Or do you want me to approve this? Or do you want me to give you a suggestion about how to proceed? What is it you want? And that's a serious mistake. You know, you want to go in and you want to make sure that you know what you want them to do and you communicate that to them in terms of what's important to them. So, I mean, think about this. If I went on a job interview and I said, yeah, I'd really like this job because I need a lot of money. <laughs> That's probably not going to make the employer go, oh, oh, he needs a lot of money. Well, I guess I better give him the job then. You know, 
you want to say, I want this job, and we go back to because. I want this job because I think I can learn a lot here and I can contribute a lot to the bottom line. Oh, well, that's much better because I want an engaged employee that contributes to the bottom line. Uh, you know, that's kind of oversimplified, but you take my point is what's that employer going to hear that makes him go, oh, okay, that's, the, that's a good reason. It's not going to be your reasons. Your reasons are I would like a job, I want money, uh, I need money to go on vacation, I need money to pay my car note, my kids in school, whatever the reasons you need money, those are not the things that are going to compel people. And that seems pretty obvious, right? Nobody really goes into a job interview and says stuff like that. But you've got to apply that even in the more subtle situations. You know, I want to use this particular kind of microprocessor because it's the one I learned about in school and I don't want to, I'm too lazy to learn another one. That's probably not going to compel anybody to go, okay, that's a good reason. Uh, if you say, okay, I want to use this particular microprocessor because it's been shown that the tools for it are 40% more productive or, you know, we already have a code base for it and da 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 it's going to save us money by not having to reinvent the wheel. There's all kinds of things you could do that the other guy probably is more interested in. But to find that out, you've got to know what you want them to do, and you've got to have the empathy. So empathy keeps coming back in, in all of this, it seems like. You know, again, I was talking to students. I did encourage them to take classes in these kind of what you think of as non-technical fields, non-technical things. You know, probably you could add some more to that too. I mean, if you really think you're going to lead projects and be a technical manager, you know, I say finance there, but it's really some economics and budgeting. And, you know, if you're working in where you're selling something, marketing could be good. Uh, you know, whether or not it's, it's worthwhile to even go as far as to get an MBA after you've got an engineering degree, a lot of people do that. Uh, I don't know. It's not the way I did it. And, you know, you can argue whether that was a good thing or not. But, but, you can't just ignore all this stuff. If you really want to be in that top crust, you've really got to go in and at least get some of this down. Here's the good news. You know, do you have to be the greatest speaker in the world or the greatest writer in the world or the greatest salesman in the world? No. You know, there's an old saying, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And generally, as a group, we engineers are not good at any of these things. So if you've got even the rudest skill at some of this, you're going to stand out really, really well. So I asked the students, because they were very interested in jobs and things, I asked them as a resume a sale. And, you know, I think everybody can see that, yeah, it is a sale. You're trying to sell something. But I think what's interesting is, look at that second question. What do you want that customer to do? So some hiring manager is going to get your resume. What do you want her to do with it? Well, you, the simplistic answer is, well, I want her to hire me. But realistically, that's not going to happen. Very few jobs just I look at the resume and go, oh, yeah, let's just hire that person. So reality is that resume is a sale to get an interview, to get more exposure to this potential job, whether it's a phone interview or an in-person interview. But that's the kind of things that you got to think about. So what's the part to the resume that's going to speak to the customer, that's going to tell them, hey, th I do want to talk to this guy some more. So it doesn't have to sell everything, but it has to sell enough to get you an interview. And I think that's kind of interesting. Now that goes back to showing value, though. So look at some resume bullets here. Designed to power supply for VPN appliance. Okay, what does that mean? Now, look down at the bottom. What if I said, design power supply for VPN appliance meeting aggressive schedule and budget constraints? Well, that's better. What if I said, designed power supply for VPN appliances meeting aggressive schedule and budget constraints while saving $2 per unit over the previous design? Okay, well, that's even better, especially if I could then say, over the life of you know 50,000 units, that was $100,000. Great, I just sold money. I just told everybody something they can understand about why I was great. I earned my company $100,000 in savings. If you don't know what VPN is, you don't understand what power supplies are, you still understand, oh, you made $100,000. Good job. Used an oscilloscope to debug design issues. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, used oscilloscope to identify and fix problem affecting 30% of the customer base, improving customer satisfaction. Okay, that's better. 
uh, again, anything you can do to say there's a number attached to it, a 30%, a $8,000, a $100,000, anything like that that you can show, but you've got to show value not just a laundry list of I did this, I did that, I created this report. I see that one all the time. I created a report. Okay, so what did that do? I created a report for senior management that allowed them to make decisions about such and such. Okay, that's better. You know, created a report for senior leadership that allowed them to find cost savings or, you know, avoid overruns or whatever. That's even better. So the, the closer you can get to saying I made or saved X number of dollars, the better off you are. So, you know, summary, technical skills are common. Non-technical skills are also common. What's not common is people who have technical and non-technical skills. If you can bridge those two worlds, there's a very high demand for those kind of people. That's that 1% engineer. Everything's a sale. Everyone's a customer. One of my favorite comments on a YouTube video I think it was a YouTube video. Anyway, it was something I, I wrote, and I, I may have been a YouTube video associated with it. But I had said uh, something about everything's a sale. And in the comments, somebody had quoted everything's a sale and said, boy, I sure am glad I don't work where you work. And someone else replied to that comment, I'm sure he's glad too. <laughs> and I, I really enjoyed that comment because it's true. Everything is a sale. And if you don't believe that, then you're probably limiting yourself. Uh, empathize with customers, sell value, show practical results. You know, none of this is real rocket science when you stop and think about it. So when I first wrote this up to go talk to the IEEE students, I, uh, I thought I'd made up the term 1% engineer. And after I finished this deck, I thought, huh, well, let me go look and see if anything's out there on Google, you know, and out on the Internet about that. And I looked up, and sure enough, there's a website, 1percentengineer.com. I'm not associated with them. I don't know who they are. It's kind of the same sort of material. Uh, it's a little more, I don't want to say low level because that's not really the right word, but it's a little more tactical, I guess, and not as strategic, I think. I, I noticed one of their videos was how to dress for an interview. Okay, well, that's good. You know, so if you're interested in this kind of topic, it might be a good website to check out, uh, see what you think. Uh, again, I'm not associated with them. They're not associated with me. This deck of charts was completely out of, I don't know how it relates to what they have on their website, but I just thought it was kind of interesting from that point of view. Anyway, that's what I did for the IEEE students the other day, and I thought I'd share it with you. I really believe, and it took me a long time to come to that realization as a young engineer, that having these additional skills, even in the smallest amounts, will really boost you career-wise, and not just career-wise, but in the th kind of things you can get done, the projects you can get attached to, the ideas that you can execute on because you've gotten people excited about them, you've gotten people to understand why they should care about them, and you've gotten people to work on them or fund them or approve them or buy them. Uh, it, it's a game changer and you know this isn't even all of it but I think it's the core idea of it is to go figure out how to empathize with people figure out how to put things in terms that they'll appreciate and find out how to negotiate and and just communicate with people and I think it's like I say I think if you try that you'll find even a little bit of it goes a long way and it's a real game changer thanks for watching